Yeah. You look like you're in a good mood today. You'll do me a favor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and start. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, two things before we get started. One, go down to the box and pick up any homework that you didn't pick up. And then two, uh, quizzes. You have some quizzes down there. Uh, you can sort through all that stuff. Okay. So we're still on track to have our exam on Wednesday. Okay, so we'll finish up the spectroscopy today. And then I'll allow you to get moving on over the weekend. All right, so let's come back to uh, let's come back to C thirteen NMR. Okay, the C thirteen NMR turns out to be two kinds of C thirteen NMR. Okay. We looked at just one kind last time. Okay. So you have what's called proton decoupled NMR. Here last time where you see one line, okay, that signal is just one line per carbon type. Okay? So what we did last time is we looked at the molecule, we looked for any planes of symmetry, and then that enabled us to see the number of different kinds of carbons. And then in the NMR, we saw one line for each different kind of carbon. Well, the other kind of C13 is what's called proton coupled. Proton coupled. Okay, what goes on here? Here, the hydrogens on a carbon split the signal. hydrogens on a carbon split the signal. Okay. And what we're going to do is again use the n plus 1 rule for them. Okay. So <clears throat> let's take a look at an example of this. Okay. Use our friend here. All the way back from the beginning, chloroethane. Okay. And again, if we were focusing on the C13, we have two different carbon atoms, and so you'd expect to see two different signals, wouldn't you? Okay, so just by way of review, the B signal would be more upfield than the A signal. Okay, and so we saw something like that. Okay, so that should be old news by now. Okay. So this here was the proton decoupled, okay? Now let's look at proton coupled, okay? So what we do, let's focus in on this CH3 here, okay? Focus in on the CH3, let's again focus in on 
that particular carbon. And that carbon, how many hydrogens are on that carbon? on the carbonyl. Okay. And so it stays as a singlet just as it would in proton decoupled NMR. Okay. Any questions on this one here? Yeah. Does it matter how you label it as long as As long as your letters match the right peaks. Okay. okay. So you can mix up the letters however you want, as long as it matches down there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. So you can see that proton coupled NMR is pretty nice, isn't it? That allows me to see if I have a CH3 or a CH3 or a CH2 or a plain carbon. That's nice information. Boy, I like that. But we end up not using that. We end up just using the proton decoupled, where we just get one line for each carbon. <coughs> Wonder why we do that. Let me give you a, an example. For simple molecules like this, that would be fine. But suppose you had a molecule All 
I don't know, that looks something like that. Okay? You don't have to draw that. Just follow along. You'll get the gist of it. Okay? If I was going to do C13 proton coupled NMR, what might I see? Well, let's look at the CH3s. I got a CH3 there. So I would see a quartet for that, right? Then I got these two CH3s there. That might be there. Look at all these different CH2s for triplets. Okay, I might get something like that. See what happens after a while? These things start coalescing. And you can't see what's a triplet or a quartet. It just becomes a big mess, doesn't it? It becomes a mess. So if you had a simple molecule, this kind of thing would be fun. But things like this, it would obviously be better to just do proton decoupled, where I just get a line per, per carbon type. See? And then that's all I need to know. Okay. Any questions on that? Why we use the proton? decoupled. Okay. Just makes it a lot easier to read. Okay, so that is the end of C13 NMR. Okay. And now we got one more spectroscopy to do for this section. Does anybody know what the name of that is? Um, What's that? Mass. Mass spectroscopy. Okay, let's take a look at that. Okay, mass spectroscopy, or we'll often abbreviate it mass spec. Okay. Is mass spectroscopy going to give me? What do you think it gives you, by the way, of the name? Yeah. The mass or the molecular weight. Okay, so you can write it down. It gives you the molecular weight of the molecule and much, much more. Okay, it gives you the molecular weight of the molecule and much, much more. Okay. So we want to investigate how all of this works. Okay, so we haven't done anything that gives you the molecular weight. We just kind of putting pizza pieces together of the molecule. But having the molecular weight, the molar mass, that would be nice too, wouldn't it? So let's see how this kind of thing works. So let's suppose we had Some molecule A, B, C, D. Okay. And what we're going to do to this molecule is we're going to blast it with an electron beam. Okay? So that's going to be pretty high energy there coming in. And when we blast it, the molecule is going to lose an electron. Okay? It's kind of like a bowling ball coming in and bumping another bowling ball out of the bowling alley. Okay? So you lose one. So the result of that. is that ABCD loses an electron and it converts to this thing here where it has a positive charge and a radical associated with it. And so, by no surprise, this thing is called a radical cation. 
Okay, so remember positive charges refer to cations. Okay, so this thing here initially forms, and then as you might expect, this thing is not very stable, and so it's going to start falling to pieces or start fragmenting. Okay? So this thing starts fragmenting. Let's look at some options. Let's say that this bond here broke. Okay. So you'd split up into these fragments. Well, one side of the fragment is going to get a positive charge. Let's just choose there. And the other fragment will get this radical that we'll just choose there. Okay, could have gone either, either way. Well, what are some other options? Let me split that middle bond, AB. And so CD would get the <coughs> radical. Okay. <clears throat> and you can continue this process. Okay. Just look at all the different combinations. Okay. So, what does the mass spectrometer machine do? Okay. What it does. Write it down. It measures the molecular weight of everything with a positive charge. It measures the molecular weight of everything with a positive charge. Okay. So where are my positive charges? Do I have any over here? I got this whole column over here. So I'd be getting the molecular weight of all those. How about these here? No. Leaves the radicals alone. Anything else? Or is that it? Yeah, the radical cation has a positive charge, so I can get this thing here, too. That's nice. That's real nice. Okay? So these are the two sets of molecular weights that mass spectroscopy gives me. Okay? And we give these two things names. Okay, the radical cation... Okay. It's also called the parent ion. Okay. If somebody is a parent, what does that automatically mean? Children. Children. You have children. Well, where are the children? Right here. Okay. What are the two kinds of children you can have? You can have what? You can have a what? That's a pretty easy answer here. Yeah, a son or a daughter. That's good. What? You can't answer that. You shouldn't be in school. Okay. So every one of us is a son or a daughter of somebody. Okay. Where were these other answers coming from? <laughs> So, what do you think these are going to be, sons or daughters? Daughters. These are going to be daughters. Okay, so 
So these are daughter ions, okay? So mass spectroscopy measures the molecular weight or the molar mass of radical cations and daughter ions. Okay, you got that? All right, well, we'll be looking at some examples in a little bit, but let's, yeah, go ahead. In order for the molecular weight to be correct, you have to have like all the options of the um, daughter ion? Um, we'll see when we do an example. Yeah, let's let our example answer that question. Okay, a good question. All right, so let's look at a rough sketch of the machine of mass spectroscopy. rough sketch of things. What we do is we put our sample here. Okay. And we have it closed off in this tube. Okay. And this tube is under vacuum. If something's under vacuum, what does that mean? Think of a suction. What are you doing? You're pulling the air out of that container. Okay. Pulling the air out of the container. So if you did that, for example, like a, to a can, like a pop can, it would collapse on itself. Okay. But anyway, back to here. What we do is we apply our electron beam to our sample, and the sample does what? It immediately ionizes okay, to become an ion beam. What do you think the ion beam is made up of? It's made up of what? The parent ion, the daughter ions, and the radicals. It has all that stuff in there that we looked at on the board. Okay, so all that is contained in the ion beam. Okay, so this ion beam is going to shoot up around the bend. And as it gets to the bend, what's going to happen? Well, you got different masses in there, don't you? Mm -hmm. Let's pretend we were each driving a different car. I was driving a bus. Somebody else was driving a juke. Okay? Maybe somebody else was driving a Corvette. Okay? Well, if we're all going 100 miles an hour, am I driving the bus? Am I able to get around there? No, I'd probably crash into this wall. So at the bend, the different masses start splitting up. Okay. And what we have on the outside of this tube is a magnet. So this beam splits up around the bend here. So one of these masses might be able to make it down and hit the recorder and start giving us a spectrum. But what about the other masses? Well, that's where the magnet comes in. Okay. The, by turning on the magnet, I can start getting the heavier masses to bend down through that tube. Okay. So by varying the magnet strength, that allows me to get either lighter ones or heavier ones around that tube. Okay. So that's the purpose of that magnet. 
and then as soon as its particle hits down here, I can record a peak that will see what those look like later. Okay? So this is how the machine works. Why do you think we have it under a vacuum? Any ideas? If I didn't have it under a vacuum, what else would be in there? Air, so oxygen, nitrogen, all those things. And so what would happen, those particles would collide with the ion beam and you'd get a bunch of jig jag in there and it would mess it up, okay? So vacuum gets rid of everything, all the air, so these ion beams, particles can come around unhindered, okay, without colliding into anything else, okay? All right, so let's look at an example of how this works. Let's look at this molecule, 2-methyl butane. And suppose we wanted to analyze it by way of mass spectroscopy. Okay? So, what is the initial mass that would show for this? The mass of the parent ion, or the whole thing. Okay? So that's the first thing I want to calculate is the molecular weight of this. Okay? So the molecular weight of the parent ion, PI. Okay? Take a couple seconds and calculate the molecular weight of that. Add it up. Carbon is 12, hydrogen is 1. You're going to have to do this on the exam, so I'll just get used to it now. Five carbons times 12 for 60, and then you got 12 hydrogens for 72. Okay? So, for the mass spectrum, the way this thing works is now zero is down at the left, like we're used to when counting numbers. Okay? So the highest peak that's going to show up is this 72 peak down here. Okay? So the highest peak will always be the parent ion. Everything else will be daughter ions, okay? which will be lower than that. Okay? So let's look at some couple of fragmentations that can happen. Let's look at that fragment that we'll call the A fragment. Okay, let's fragment it like that. Okay, we'll put the positive charge there. And let's look at another fragment. We'll call this the B fragment. And so we get those there. And I'll choose to put the positive charge on this side. Okay, we'll see why I chose those in a second. Okay, 
So if you remember from organic part one, remember your cation stability order. Okay, this was your cation stability order. Tertiary greater than secondary greater than primary. Okay, so here's the rule. You want to write it down. I want to fragment the parent ion to give me the most stable carbocations that can form. I want to fragment so the most stable carbocations can form. So you see why I put the carbocations on these particular carbons. Okay. The most stable one is the tertiary, but could I fragment this to get a tertiary? No. Mark it down. I can only fragment carbon-carbon bonds, not carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay. So I can't fragment any carbon-carbon bond to give me tertiary. The best I can do is carbon-carbon bonds to give me secondary. Okay. So this was the A fragment. This was the B fragmentation. Once you figure out those, then you calculate the molecular weights of these. Give me a second. Add up the molecular weights of these two. the peaks for these two down. They don't have a positive charge. I leave radicals on, except the radical cap, which will always be that. Okay. So you see what this mass spec gives you? It gives you the molecular weight of the original molecule and much more. See that? So that can help me a little bit with some structure. Okay. If I ever see a peak at 43, it's usually an isopropyl group. See that? I see a peak at 57. It's usually this butyl where the attachment is on the second carbon. Okay. See how that works? I have a question. Yeah. For um, when we did the iron and all that, the peak height was like based on how many hydrogens we were. Having. Yeah, the but peak height doesn't the really refer to the number of okay. hydrogens or carbons. Okay. What the peak height does, okay. In fact, let me accentuate that. The peak height refers to the carbocation stability. Okay, so usually you'll see these peaks down here being much higher than the parent ion. Okay, so the parent ion is usually a very short peak. Okay, and. On the x-axis, these numbers are called the m to z, or what's called the mass to charge ratio. Okay, so the mass is the mass of the thing in question, and the charge is always what plus one. So 
you know, it just comes down to the mass, but that's how we record these things as the mass to charge ratio. Any other questions on this one? How do you know where to split them, like the A and the B? Uh, split so that I'm getting at least a secondary carbocation. Okay. If I could get a tertiary, go for it, but I can't on that. Anything else? Okay. Another way you could have calculated these numbers is back over here. The molar mass of this is 72. So if I did a A split, A is a CH3 I'm taking off. CH3 weighs 12 plus 3, 15. So I can quickly subtract 15 and get the 57. Okay, so that's one way you could do it. This one down here would be 72 minus 40 minus 29. Or 43. Okay, for the B split. Okay, just another way sometimes Students like that kind of thing. It's a little bit of a short time. Okay, well, let's look at our handout. Okay, turn to this page here. Okay, we'll see a mass spectrum. for hexane. So let's see how they're handling that. Okay, so there's hexane. So what is the first peak you should always calculate? Parent. And what is the parent peak for that? Yeah, you look right on the chart. 86, the highest peak. Okay. So the mass spectrum gives that to you nicely. Okay. Isn't that nice information? So that parent ion is sometimes called the M plus peak. You can see how they label that there. Okay, and then they did what? Started looking at the different fragments. Okay, so if we started to fragment this thing, there's no way to get a tertiary, is there? Mm -hmm. There's no way to get a secondary, is there? They're all going to be primary carbocations. Okay? So that's the best we can do. So if we split here, okay, if you look on what they're doing on the chart there, what they do, they took 86 minus this thing is 15. So I would get something at 71, and sure enough, you do. Okay. Then you could look at fragmenting here. So that would be 86 minus this is 29. Okay. Give you what? 57. <coughs> And so we see that nice peak at 57. Okay. And then keep chopping away. Our next one is at 43 and so on. Okay. So that gives you an idea of what these charts look like. 
Okay. Any questions on that? There's one other thing to look at the chart that maybe caught your eye. If you look at the chart, what are you seeing? You know, for example, look at 40. You're seeing a lot of lines there. Okay. So it's not called splitting. That's just NMR. This is mass spec. Okay. So wonder what those extra lines are for. Well, remember each line is measuring a mass. It's measuring a mass. So carbon, remember, has isotopes from carbon 12 up to carbon 14. Hydrogen has different isotopes. Okay. Proton, deuterium, tritium. Okay. So it has different isotopes. So what is mass spectroscopy doing here? It's saying, wow, well, any molecule might have any number of those options. And each one has one extra weight than the previous one. So that's heavier than that by one AMU and so on. So the mass spectro spectroscopy is that sensitive, saying, boy, if you just change it by one, I can pick that up. And so it gives me that extra line there, okay? But if you look, say for example, at the 43 peak, which of those lines at the 43 peak is the tallest? The 43 peak. What is the 43 peak representing? Carbon 12 and hydrogen one. Why is that? Because these are what? The most abundant of carbon and hydrogen. Okay? So that's why those peaks in each case were the highest. So that's what those extra, sometimes called satellite peaks are called, and what they refer to, these extra isotopes that you'll see. Are you going to have the Oh, no. No, just be worried about the main peak. Yeah. Any other questions on mass spectroscopy? So that's the end of this section. Okay. So your exam will be next Wednesday, 3 to 5, on all the spectroscopy from IR to this stuff here. Okay. So make sure you use the weekend to study well. Okay. You can pick up, again, your quizzes and homework downstairs in the box.